My name is Stella Varvis. I work at the Alberta Law Reform Commission, and I'm currently doing graduate research in disability and the law. I am thrilled to be moderating today's panel discussion. I'm coming to you today from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional meeting ground and home for many Indigenous people, including Cree, Sotu, Nisitapi, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. Many people today are joining us from other locations, and I invite everyone to reflect on the land on which they are situated and the Indigenous peoples who call those lands home. In 2017, more than 6 million Canadians over the age of 15, representing approximately 22% of the population, identified as having a disability. In 2019, after many years of tireless work by disability advocates across the country, the federal government enacted the Accessible Canada Act, which has been touted as the single greatest development in federal disability rights legislation since the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But what really is the promise of accessibility legislation? How did the disability rights movement in Canada bring us to this watershed moment? And where do we go from here to build fully inclusive and barrier-free communities? To answer these questions, I am delighted to introduce our panelists. David Lepofsky is the chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. While he has worn many hats over his distinguished career, including law professor, crown prosecutor, community advocate, op-ed writer, many would consider David to be the father of accessibility legislation in Canada. He will be speaking first this afternoon. Greg McMeekin is the chair of the Premier's Council on the Status of Persons with Disabilities. When Greg was called to the Alberta Bar in 2016, it made the news. An article from the Calgary Herald noted that he was the first child with a physical disability to enroll in the city's public school system back in the 1970s. Personally, I think Greg is remarkable because he's the most optimistic Calgary Flames fan I have ever met. So Greg will be our second speaker. Dr. Emil Joseph is Associate Professor in the School of Social Work at McMaster University. On his recent appointment as Faculty of Social Sciences Inaugural Professor of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Indigenous Strategies, one of his colleagues described Emil as a thoughtful, generous and effective teacher and mentor and a highly engaged citizen of the university and wider communities with which his research intersects. He will be our third speaker. Emil was unexpectedly called away this morning, so he pre-recorded his comments, which will play when it is his turn to speak. Each of our speakers will have approximately 10 minutes to share their thoughts about the promise, as well as the limits of accessibility legislation. We will then open a question and answer session. Please note that this panel discussion is being recorded. If you are live tweeting this event, we invite you to use the hashtag Accessible Canada so that others can follow you. For those of you watching our live feed, there are two ways to participate in the question and answer session. If you would like to ask your question live, please indicate that you would like to speak by either raising your virtual hand, which you can find at the bottom of your screen under reactions, or by sending us a note through the chat. I ask that you keep yourself muted until your name is called. You can also ask questions privately in the chat at any time during the presentation. We will collect your questions and share them with the panelists after they have finished their opening remarks. If we receive a number of similar questions, we will group them together by theme. Please remember that since this discussion is only scheduled for an hour, we invite you to keep your questions short. We may not be able to get all questions, but we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. At this point, I'd like to invite our first speaker, David Lepofsky, for his opening remarks. David has generously shared with us a two and a half minute video demonstrating some of the very real accessibility challenges uh, issues that can often be found in the physical environment. This video challenges us to consider how we access public spaces and how certain design choices can create unintentional barriers to access. After the video, David speak, will speak for approximately 10 minutes. Stairs. On one side of the main lobby stairs is a pillar in the middle of the stairs. I walk right into it 
when I finally find the handrail on the right side of this bizarre column, it doesn't lead me up the stairs to the landing. Instead, it loops me past the top of the column and back down the adjacent stairs. There are stairs with angled railings outside the building going up to the front door. The main lobby staircase goes up two floors. Railings divide it into four parallel sets of stairs. The right handrail is skewed to the left, cutting in front of a person as they walk up the stairs. The left handrail is at a skewed angle too. If you hold the railing like I did, your feet are guided in the wrong direction. This is a tripping hazard for blind people and for those with balance issues. Staircase railing should never be angled. Designers may think it looks cool, but it creates safety and accessibility problems. On the sixth floor is a room called the beach area for students to hang out and study. Stairs go from the front of the room up to the back of the room. There's a landing between each short flight of stairs. The stairs don't follow a straight path from the front of the room to the back. Speeding up the video, see how lost I get? Ramps. Here's an outside ramp to get from the street level to the building's front entrance one floor up. The ramp's route is quite a maze. Normally, ramps follow a simple pattern, a straight line or switchback. That outdoor ramp has no railing. People with balance issues need a railing. I need one to follow a maze-like ramp. Angled pillars. Nothing should ever protrude at any height into a path of travel. No pillar should ever lean at an angle. When I go up the outdoor ramp from street level to the front door, there's a leaning pillar on my left side. My shoulder brushes right up against it. When I take that exterior elevator to the ground floor and walk outside, there's a leaning pillar in my path. I hit my head right near my right ear. It's troubling that this building won architectural awards. Here's a web page announcing that it received the Canadian Architect 2011 Award of Excellence. Accessibility deserves greater priority. Okay, can you hear me? Just want to make sure I'm unmuted. You can. Okay, great. Well, greetings, everybody, from uh, beautiful Midtown Toronto. I'm sorry I can't be out west, and I'm sorry we can't all be together, but let's uh, tackle a problem together. Uh, as that video describes, we live or typifies, we live in a society which has been too uh, for too long designed and operated on the implicit, implied, but pervasive and ridiculous premise that it's principally for people without disabilities. Yes, the buildings we go to, like the brand new uh, uh, student learning center at Ryerson University in the heart of downtown Toronto that I depicted in that video, not chosen because it's the worst, but because it's typical. The places of employment where we go to work, the stores where we shop and the goods we want to buy in them, the public transit we ride, the education systems that we attend uh, to learn both in school and in post-secondary, they are all designed and operated on this premise. Similarly, the laws uh, that are written for us and the court systems that we go to to get those laws impl implemented and enforced also largely drawn up and operated on that premise. Not because anyone's against us, but because that's just the way it's been done. And frankly, uh, this doesn't just hurt the 6 million Canadians who now have a disability. It does not just hurt uh, over a billion people around the world with disabilities who might want to come to visit Canada or live here, it actually hurts everybody because everybody either has a disability now or will get one later in life. All you got to do is get older because getting older is the most common cause uh, of disability. 
Well, what do we do about it? We live in a world full of barriers, a world that is ultimately not very accommodating for the minority of everyone. Well, there have been two solutions tried up till now. Well, actually three. One is let's raise awareness. The reason people create barriers is not because they want to hurt us. They just haven't thought of it. So all we got to do is raise their awareness. And there are people who've spent their lives doing this, built their reputations on this. The only problem is it doesn't work. They keep raising awareness. We keep facing these barriers. The second idea was, well, we need government policies. If the government would come up with a policy and a plan and a strategy and, a, and, a, and an announcement or two, that'll change things. But policies aren't enforceable and can change or be ignored. So the third solution, there ought to be a law. Let's make these barriers illegal. And we did that. We did that in the Charter of Rights for the Public Sector. We did that in our human rights legislation across Canada for the public and private sectors. But all of these things, while helpful, did not solve the problem. The old barriers still remain too often. And as quickly as some of the old barriers go, to, go away, new ones pop up. So what we, what we need is a new law, not one to replace the Charter of Rights and Human Rights Codes, but a law that will make the rights that we win in those laws become a reality in our lives as people with disabilities. Whether your disability like mine is blindness or deafness or a communication disability or a physical disability or a mental, dis mental health disability or an intellectual disability, learning disability, communication disability, neurological, whatever it may be. Well, how do you design such a law? Well, you gotta look at why everything else hasn't worked. Well, everything else hasn't worked for a few reasons. One, where their awareness raising and their policies or programs or strategies, they're not enforceable, they're not mandatory. And as anybody knows uh, who goes to university, the first question on any student's mind is, is that on the exam? If it's not on the exam, I'm not gonna worry about it. Well, making it a binding law is the equivalent of putting it on the exam. The second thing is our human rights codes, our charter of rights require us as individuals to become private accessibility cops suing and litigating one barrier at a time. People with disabilities don't have the time, the energy, the money to litigate all the barriers they face, even the vast majority of them, even half of them. It's just not realistic. And the other reason we're in this predicament is because if you're an obligated organization, if you own a store, if you're an employer, if you run a university or a school principal, and you want to do the right thing, you pick up the Human Rights Code, the Charter of Rights, and you read them and you go, this doesn't tell me how to make sure my website is accessible. This doesn't tell me that I shouldn't use PDFs unless I provide an accessible alternative format. This just says like, don't discriminate and do accommodate. That's all great, but tell me what I gotta do. So we need a mandatory law that is enforceable without individuals having to, having to be private accessibility cops. And that gives obligated organizations clear directions on what they have to do and when. That's the template for accessibility legislation, not as a replacement, but to make Charter of Rights and Human Rights Codes guarantees become a reality in our lives. So how are we doing in Canada? We started in Ontario. I had the privilege of leading the campaign starting in 94 that led to the enactment in 2005 of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And since then, provinces that have followed in those footsteps are Manitoba, then Nova Scotia, then British Columbia, and most recently being debated in the legislature for Newfoundland and Labrador. Folks, you're in Alberta, you are in what we from a disability accessibility perspective would call a have not province. And we'd love you to join. How, and on top of that, as you heard in the introduction, the National uh, Accessible Canada Act was passed uh, a couple of years ago to fill in 
the federal sphere that the provinces can't regulate, such as banking, telecommunications, uh, and, uh, and things like that. Now that, and interprovincial transportation, air travel, and so on. Well, how are these laws all doing? Well, so far, unfortunately, I have to say, we are not making anywhere near the progress we should. In the case of Ontario, we were the first to start on it. And our law requires an accessible province to be established within 20 years of the law being passed. That's just a little over three years from now. We are way behind because the government, not because it was a weak law, but because they've done a very poor job of implementing it. That's not to say it's done nothing. We are unquestionably further ahead than we would have been without it, but you can learn from us how to do it better. How about the other provinces? Well, foot dragging so far in the other provinces that we've seen and federally, while it was the minister who brought in the Accessible Canada Act, Carla Qualtro, who in a self-congratulatory way said it's the, the biggest development in disability rights since the Charter of Rights, that's because there have been so few steps federally for disability rights since then. There are things about that law that are good, but it is far too weak. It is way too long. It is unbelievably and unnecessarily complicated. Uh, and it does not require the federal government to take the actions uh, that we need to make that law strong and effective. So if I was in Alberta and I wanted to make progress, I'd go to my government and say, let's do it. Let's get it right. Let's do better than the other provinces. Let's come up with a law that the others should want to imitate. And as for that, we, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, would love to help you. Let me end with a couple of pieces of contact information. This is all up on the blog for this conference. But if you want to learn more about us, go to our website, aodaalliance.org. And there is a sign up link right on the homepage to get our updates. So sign up to get them. They'll give you ideas. We'd welcome yours. Follow us on Twitter at AODA Alliance, at AODA Alliance. And finally, if our organizers will share the link, we are, we've made available a series of captioned uh, lectures that will give you all sorts of background. We have one on the an introduction to the AODA, AODA 101. And most recently, I recorded a lecture just three weeks ago on what is the duty to accommodate people with disabilities. It's meant for people with disabilities, uh, employers, store owners, school principals, and the like. And so far, we've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of views. I encourage you to check it out because it's all that knowledge in one place. I look forward to my, my fellow panelists and to your questions. And let's get Alberta to go from being a have not province to a leading province in the area of accessibility for the minority of everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. A number of the links that David have mentioned have been put into the chat um, for the participants to see. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions about your call to action, David, when it comes to how do we make a better um, law in Alberta to be a leader across the province or across the country. Um, I'll invite now uh, Greg McMeegan to speak and to provide us with his comments uh, for approximately 10 minutes. Thanks, Phil. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you to discuss this important topic. My presentation will focus on what Alberta is and hopefully as David alerted to in his remarks, where we ought to go. <clears throat> Let me say the comments from the panelists today only scratch the surface of these issues. So please let's keep this conversation rolling. Um, I would like to begin with, with um, talking about accessibility and how it relates to uh, the access of, access of justice. 
what does accessibility mean? Accessibility means to me giving people with disabilities the opportunity to pursue a normal, healthy life without barriers. Access, uh, accessibility gives people with disabilities the opportunity to pursue employment, consumer goods and services, the use of public transportation, physically uh, to physically access public spaces, and just to just to lead a normal life. We when we hear uh, uh, the term accessibility, accessibility is often um, first thought of in the realm of the built environment. The pandemic has shown us that there are much greater issues at play. People with disabilities have had difficulty um, accessing um, income supports. They've had uh, difficulty accessing healthcare, accessing um, me uh, mental health supports, accessing education. So how do, uh, and of course, access to justice. When I hear about ind individuals with disabilities having uh, difficulty uh, uh, retaining a lawyer uh, to, to solve their legal issues, this is disturbing. When I hear about people with disabilities being unable to access courts or, or afraid to go to court because they're afraid that they'll be misunderstood or they won't have their rights uh, be able to speak about their rights and their issues. That is disturbing. When I hear about people with disabilities not even bringing their issues forward to, to police services or to prosecution services. This is disturbing. Why is this important? Because we are all human beings. We all deserve the right to live normal, independent lives and to access these services that most people take for granted. How can we solve this? Accessible, accessibility legislation would go a long way to solving these issues. So what is accessible legislation? In contrast to uh, human rights legislation, Accessible legislation requires applicable or, uh, organizations to comply with accessibility standards. As I mentioned before, it would provide people with disabilities the opportunity to access various things, uh, various aspects of public life and to be able to support their families. So why does Alberta need it? Alberta needs it because as David mentioned in his remarks, we're lacking far behind in terms of accessibility. I lived in Ontario for a number of years and I can, I still remember fondly the time I had and how supportive, supported I felt uh, 
while I was down there. Ontario, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, and British Columbia has it. Alberta needs accessibility legislation to move forward. So what current protections exist in Alberta for people with disabilities? Alberta's uh, current disability consists of um, acts addressing specific, uh, specific aspects of uh, disabilities and acts um, that have a different focus that however mention uh, disabilities within um, that legislation. There are over 30 pieces of legislation in Alberta dealing with disability issues currently. However, only one of them um, has a central uh, principle uh, aspect of disability in it, and that is the Human Rights Act. Uh, which includes uh, physical and mental disability in its list of prohibited grounds for various types of discrimination. It does not help, uh, however, mention the duty to accommodate, which should be the norm in terms of law. So, how would, um, how does, how would the uh, potential Alberta Accessibility Act uh, interplay with the um, Canada Accessible Act. As David mentioned, um, mo most of the aspects of the um, Canada Accessibility Act deal with federally regulated uh, buildings and policies. Um, uh, the the um, buildings and policies under this act aren't covered, uh, wouldn't be covered under um, Alberta legislation. Alberta needs um, uh, legislation to cover off the other aspects that are um, dealt with under federal legislation. So, are there other options available? Uh, yes, there are. But Alberta legislation could potentially do three things. It could uh, help alleviate confusion around how the different laws interact. It could preserve good laws uh, that deal with specific issues or that satisfy modern standards. And it could override numerous uh, outdated uh, standards at one time. What could potential Alberta accessibility legislation include. Um, just to give an, uh, some examples, it could in include information and communication, employment, transportation, design of built environments, consumer service, as I mentioned, access to goods and services, healthcare and education. Let me just say we've made great progress in recent history. A lot of people have been working on this issue for a long time. I commend all the efforts and hard work that has gone into working with disability issues. 
but we need this legislation to move forward. People with disabilities aren't looking for special treatment. They are just looking for a way to lead as normal lives as possible and to support themselves. And I, I think that's all that anybody deserves. So I'm not sure where my 10 minutes is at still, but um, I think I'll leave there and, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the question period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. And, uh, and certainly I, I imagine there'll be some questions for you about where we're at right now when it comes to moving towards accessibility legislation in Alberta. At this point, um, I think we can put forward um, Dr. Joseph's video, his pre-recorded comments, uh, since he was unable to join us today. And then after that, we will begin the question and answer period. Hi, all. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but uh, thank you for, for the invitation uh, and for covering this important topic. You know, when, when, when I think about where accessibility legislation fits within uh, a concept of disability justice, <clears throat> I think about how historically, socially, and politically loaded the words accessibility and accommodation are. They, they tell us a lot about what is being asked for, uh, what had been fought for, and, and why it's necessary to legislate action to counter the intergenerational impacts of ableism, sanism, and eugenics. For those that are somewhat uh, familiar with my work, I have for many years been attending to the ways discourses about race ability, mental health, and criminality have been wielded with what were often benevolent intents and, and ideas that have uh, recast perspectives of burden and risk, threat and deficit on the people with disabilities, uh, those living with mental health issues, and Black, Indigenous, and other racialized groups. And these have always been uh, gendered and connected to ideas of of deviance and sexuality, as well as uh, socioeconomic status or class privilege. Uh, we know people like Charles Kirk Clark, a psychiatrist for whom, uh, which the, the, the college and Spadina site of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto was once named after. Uh, Clark advocated for, for limits on immigration to limit how newcomers could access social assistance. Uh, as well as charity and other forms of health and social care, because there was, a, uh, at the time, a eugenic belief that newcomers and immigrants were carriers of, of some sort of hereditary defectiveness. We, we know people like Dr. Helen McMurchie, who was Ontario's leading uh, public health expert in 1914, and she had a title called Inspector of the Feeble-Minded, from 1906 to 1916. Uh, in her role uh, as, as first chief of the Division of Maternal and Child Welfare in 1920, she sought to affect public health needs in the areas of infant mortality, uh, maternal mortality, and what they called feeble-mindedness at the time. McMurchy declared at a conference in 1914 that, and I quote, the problem of defective children could only be solved if, if special education and medical inspection were complemented by restrictions uh, of immigration. And these eugenic ideas have always been connected to racial anti-immigrant discourses about people with mental health issues and disabilities as threat, burden, risk, and always in terms of lack. What we did with these ideas was embed them in the law. And, and the, the 1910 Immigration Act added a section on, on prohibited classes. And under Section 3 of the Immigration Act of 1910, 
uh, these prohibited classes were identified as as uh, things like persons mentally defective, diseased persons, persons physically defective, uh, criminals, prostitutes or pimps, procurers, beggars and vagrants, charity immigrants, persons not complying with regulations. All of these compiled together, uh, attaching a notion of of burden and lack and disease and disability and mental health to notions of criminality and cost uh, tied to anti-immigration ideas about that were bound to eugenic policy that targeted people uh, in, 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 in really uh, horrible ways. So why is this important? Well, right now we have this, a clause in our immigration law that, that wields these ideas of threat and burden to deny newcomers and immigrants access to healthcare. People can still be, to this day, rendered inadmissible to Canada after already having lived here and made to refrain from using hospitals or, uh, for, or institutional care for any kind of physical or mental illness. And you know we call this the excessive demand clause that people have time and again tried to have abolished. And specifically, the, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act states that <clears throat> under Section 38, that a foreign national is inadmissible on health grounds if their health condition is A, likely to be a danger to the public or public health, uh, that, that uh, B, they're likely to be a danger to public safety, or C, might reasonably be expected to cause quote unquote, excessive demand on health and social services. Then <clears throat> the current immigration guidelines include specificity that says examples of, a, of excessive demand include ongoing hospitalization or institutional care for a physical or mental illness right there in policy and law. And in, in my book on deportation, of the cases I studied for people with mental health issues being given removal orders or deportation orders, 86% were from countries of the global south. South Asia, East Asia, Africa, Southeast Asia, West Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. You know, we can, we can also talk very locally about uh, Leilani Muir, uh, a woman who was sterilized in Alberta under the Sexual Sterilization Act, a law that was implemented in, in 1928 that allowed for sterilization of, of people labeled mentally disabled in order to prevent uh, what they thought was transmission of traits deemed undesirable. So Muir was sterilized in, in 1959. The, the Sterilization Act itself was repealed in, in 1972, but not before some 4,800 people were sterilized through that law. And Muir was the first to be successful in a lawsuit against the Alberta government for sterilization. Uh, Muir was sent to the Provincial Training School for Mental Defectives, that's what it was called, also known as the Michener Center. Uh, she was sent there at the age of 10 and sterilized for scoring too low on an IQ test. Uh, and since Muir's case, you know, 850 Albertans who were sterilized, who were sterilized uh, under the Sexual Sterilization Act were awarded uh, $142 million in, in damages. So, you know, when I think about the limits of legislation and the limits of terms like accessibility and accommodation, I, I worry about how ideas of, of burden and deficit and risk and lack get circulated in neo-eugenic ways that summon all manner of trope and idea of human hierarchy and the dangers of this uh, if we don't consider the confluence of ways that policy and law can be relied upon to actually advance the very forms of discrimination we're attempting to address. So you know, I'm, I'm not against accessibility legislation, quite the opposite. I think, I think we need to consolidate these recognitions and law in ways that do not reproduce inequities and injustices uh, for people with disabilities. I, I also appreciate that the word accommodation itself 
carries the idea that exclusion, uh, oppression, and, and marginalization are, are some sort of individualized matters of, of discrimination and human rights, rather than something that we can appreciate systemically and structurally. I think we can, of course, address issues of disproportionate inaccessibility, but we also should be thinking about the pathways to justice for those seeking a remedy. If the system we design as intervention is only complaints driven and individualized in this conception, how are we advancing a project that aims to dismantle the foundations of eugenics and ableism and sanism within policy and practice uh, carried out by professionals and professions and disciplines and the law. What I'm getting at there is the need for a, a principled approach to accessibility legislation that considers the broader social, historical, and political context to think about a goal of a more universal design. I think this is, this is necessary so that our legislation does not set up a scenario that sees someone coming, coming forward with a, an accessibility concern as a burden, who then requires you know, medical inspection to prove themselves and documentation, who is then viewed as someone who is an excessive demand, who uh, is then also viewed as a liability, and, uh, you know, a cost, a risk, a burden. Now, we can also and should think about how accessibility policy and law can be crafted in such a way that it questions the design of our institutions beyond physical environments and beyond physical and mental tropes of disability. To think about how eugenic ideas and policies and practices have to be held up to the light and interrogated and examined and possibly completely abolished in, in favor of creating something entirely new. And to do so requires all of us to think about our everyday complicities with the reproduction of these ideas of threat, of risk, of burden and lack as they advance from these biomedical ideas of human hierarchy and disability and undesirability. When we are thinking about accessibility, I think we, we also must think about access to what? Uh, when we think about accommodations, we also need to think about how systems of complaint or request themselves can perpetuate ideas of burden. If the thing we are creating equitable access to is also ableist in design, no level of accommodation might render it just for people with disabilities. To have someone raise a, an accommodation request only to feel, only to feel you know, uh, surveilled or othered, inspected, to feel that they are a burden, then even experience that the accessibility policy or legislation are a process of accumulating demands that can create more barriers for them we may need to be more open to tearing down systems and structures as part of the process and see accessibility legislation as a key component part of a larger project of justice for, for, for uh, people with disabilities. Um, thank you to Dr. Joseph. Uh, his comments certainly challenged us all to think about our conceptualizations of accessibility uh, and encourages us, I think, to look at some of those broader and more systemic issues. So we are at the beginning of our question and answer session. Uh, again, I encourage you, if you'd like to ask your question live, to just indicate so by raising your hand using the reaction function at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, you are welcome to, of course, uh, type your question in the chat, which will, will come to me and my co-host. Um, if you would like to ask a question live but cannot raise your hand or cannot use that function, again, you can just mention that in the chat and we will call on you. Uh, perhaps I can get us started with um, a first question. So the phrase, nothing about us without us is a very commonly heard refrain within the disability community. 
And what it really means is that laws and policies that affect the lives of persons with disabilities should be informed by their lived experience. Um, certainly, the Accessible Canada Act includes a statutory duty to consult within its legal framework. So I'd like to ask the speakers if they have any thoughts about the duty to consult and how can decision makers make it really meaningful and purposeful um, for persons with disabilities as opposed to it being just a box you need to check off on a list. Uh, perhaps David, you can uh, address that question and then we'll give Greg the opportunity as well. Okay, uh, I'm happy to and my thoughts I think may convince you but are gonna sound counterintuitive. I think the invocation of, of nothing about us without us becomes overblown and it actually becomes a harmful uh, uh, distraction. And I'll tell you two reasons why. Uh, using the Accessible Canada Act as the example. So first, um, what you need under this legislation is a requirement for the government to develop strong accessibility standards that detail what people have to do so they know what they have to do. Well, the federal government is given the power to do it, but it's split among three agencies, which triples our work. Um, that's among cabinet, the Canadian Transportation Agency and the CRTC. But then, they, in the meantime, and they don't even require them to make the standards. They mean, and they've in fact avoided, rejected calls for the community to set timelines within which they have to do that. And that's important because what we've learned in Ontario is this just goes on and on and it takes way too long. And I can give you illustrations of that. But instead what they say is to the, each of the regulated industries, you have to consult with people with disabilities. Well, what that means is that Air Canada is supposed to consult people with disabilities about barriers and air travel. So is Porter Air, so is WestJet, so is every other airline. Well, guess what? They're the same barriers. And we don't have the time, infrastructure, and energy to go tell them all the same thing over and over. What there should be is a standards development process where we say it once, we say it to all of them, and then the standard is set that takes it into account. Instead, the minister can, you know, head about saying, oh, well, well, I believe in nothing about us without us. Look at all the consulting. And people go, yay, look at all the consulting. Well, you shouldn't say yay, but some people may be distracted into thinking that means they should say yay. In fact, I think a lot of people saw through it. The other thing is there is the risk of the government then creating advisory bodies and pointing to them and saying, you see, we're talking to these 20 people or 15 people that we handpicked, nothing about us without us, we've consulted. And in the case of the, uh, uh, the COVID pandemic, the federal government did just that. And they got a, a body together to give input, but we haven't seen any real action come from it. So they claim they consulted we don't do any better. Now, that's not to say there isn't a role for consultation. Don't get me wrong. But it has to be built in in a way where we don't have to say the same thing over and over to one organization after the next, where we could just say it once. Um, and, uh, uh, and one that takes into account the fact that the disability community in any of our provinces is is not equipped to do what, I don't know, the oil industry or the insurance industry could do, which is to have a bunch of lobbyists ready to respond to every time the government asks for, for input. Back to you. Great, thank you for that. Uh, Greg, would you like to also comment? Yeah, sure, Stella, thank you. Um, I completely, with the comments that David has said, the one um, aspect that I would like to mention is that it's important when we look at disability issues to look at a pan-disability perspective. And so that's why it's important to um, consult with as many groups as possible. Uh, but, but as a, um, as David alluded to, it's it's, it's very difficult to 
give the same advice over and over and over again. So it would be good if there was a standard um, uh, procedure in place. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, we have a question in here that was submitted, and uh, I think it uh, is part of the part of your comments, Greg, had to do with how the pandemic has exacerbated certain issues when it comes to um, people with disabilities. So I think the question is related to that, and uh, and the individual would like to have a little bit more information about how the pandemic has affected existing issues, specifically in terms of access to justice. So Greg, perhaps you can uh, speak to that first and then David. I, uh, well, um, sure, thank you, Stella. Um, I would say one of the major issues to, uh, with respect to access to, to justice and people with disabilities um, is, that, is the fact that people with disabilities can't afford uh, to hire a lawyer to handle the, whatever their legal issues may be. A lot of, um, sorry, um, many people with disabilities are on age or income support and cannot uh, afford the fees of a lawyer. Um, uh, legal aid, um, you have to uh, make a certain amount before you're eligible. And so when people with disabilities uh, hear that, they just uh, give up and don't pursue their, um, their remedies. Um, they're also, uh, I've also heard of uh, people with disabilities being afraid to go into court uh, because they won't be understood or they don't know the legal process or they're just intimidated. Um, <clears throat> some of the courtrooms I know from personal experience are not accessible. Um, um, uh, people do the best job they can under the circumstances, but um, accessibility still remains. And the physical ac accessibility uh, still remains an issue. David? I'll give you, uh, it's David here, I'll give you three quick points. Uh, just building on that very helpful answer. Uh, first, uh, in Ontario, uh, our uh, crisis move to online learning for months has seriously hurt students with disabilities, and the provincial government basically left it to 72 school boards to reinvent the wheel and figure out how to solve it, which is about the most inefficient way to do something, especially in a crisis. Uh, the I'm a member of the kindergarten to grade 12 education standards development committee that the government itself appointed. We have representatives of the disability sector and the education sector. And we are working on proposals for an education accessibility standard under the AODA. But in the middle of the pandemic, just three months into it, a year ago, July, uh, or four months into it, we made uh, gave the government and the government uh, made public a detailed series of recommendations on how to ensure reopened schools and distance learning would be accessible. The government received it, but hasn't done anything to implement it as far as we've seen, which is very troubling. But at least the, the AODA gave a platform to get us together with school board reps to put our heads together and come up with this agenda and against which the government's conduct can be measured. My second example is going to unfortunately sound particularly resonant in Alberta right now. Um, when we had a surge in the pandemic uh, months ago, there was the worry that our hospitals would get so overloaded that they would have to ration or triage critical care beds because there would be more people needing life-saving critical care than there would be patients uh, or there would be places, beds, doctors, and, and ventilators. Well, the government in secret had a bunch of doctors and bioethicists write up a protocol for how this should be done. 
It was eventually leaked. Disability community hit the roof because it was blatant disability discrimination. The government said, oh, we want our bioethics table to consult uh, disability advocates. So a bunch of us consulted and gave them input to explain to them because they were frankly oblivious to what basic human rights principles were that would apply. They're nice people, but just didn't know. But then the government, the, the, this, uh, the government accepted and sat back while hospitals were sent a revised secret protocol. Again, leaked. You'll find it on our website, but I don't know if you'll find it anywhere else, aodaalliance.org slash healthcare. Um, and what, what we found out is, again, blatant discrimination because of disability uh, on the very issue of being able to Stay, stay alive. I'm going to send you a triage video link. Uh, in the chat, I don't know if it's reaching everybody, but I will send it to Anna after if that doesn't work. Actually, just like triage video, TR. Also, it's captioned. Uh, and I explain in detail what this is all about. Finally, on the court accessibility, the, uh, there are many barriers in our court system and our mediation system. Um, I've had the privilege of being there to work on various of these issues. In Ontario, commendably, there is a permanent committee of the judiciary, the government, legal profession, and disability representatives that have been working since 2007 on strategies to make the court system accessible. If people want to know more about it, reach, reach out to me after, because we've got a long way to go, but we've made uh, a, a certain amount of progress. Um, as well, there is online available a handbook for mediators, people who do mediations on how to accommodate people with disabilities, written by a colleague of mine, Professor uh, Martha Simmons, uh, and uh, co-authored by me, and it's full of practical tips. There are ways to tear down these barriers, but without the proper legislation and the proper action within the justice community, it's not going to happen. Thank you, David. Um, I noticed that we're getting extremely short on time and we have a number of questions still in the queue. So I think what we'll do is uh, collect those questions that are in the chat and uh, and share them with our um, our speakers. Uh, I do need to um, close, unfortunately, because we've only asked for an hour of your time. But uh, like I said, we will collect any outstanding questions and put them to our speakers and see if we can um, share some of those uh, responses. Um, so first of all, thank you to everyone for sending in your questions. And uh, I, I'm sorry, we only have the hour. Uh, I I would like to give my sincere thanks uh, to David Lepofsky, Greg McMeekin, and Dr. Emil Joseph for sharing your thoughts and insights about the um, promises of accessibility legislation as well as the, the limitations. Uh, as I noted earlier, this presentation is being recorded. So all registered participants will receive a link to the recording. We'll also be sharing a short feedback survey and would certainly appreciate hearing from you about your thoughts on today's panel discussion and any other questions that you may have. Um, in closing, I also would like to acknowledge the University of Alberta Faculty of Law Visiting Speaker Series for its financial support, Joshua St. Pierre from the Faculty of Arts Department of Political Science, who made a number of helpful suggestions during the organizational phase, Sarah Kent, who assisted with logistical support and communications, as well as Tim Young from the Faculty of Law, our extremely capable ASL interpreters and live captioner, uh, Robin, Jody, Shannon, thank you so much for um, keeping up with what was a very lively discussion. Uh, lastly, but definitely not least, a special thanks to Professor Anna Lund, who is the CBA Alberta co-chair of the Access to Justice Week. She organized today's uh, panel discussion. Thank you to everyone for attending and have a wonderful afternoon.